Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to Firelight Media's uh, series, Beyond Resilience. Uh, you, today, we will be having a conversation entitled Un Undocumenting Storytelling Through the Undocumented Lens. My name is Loira Limbal. I am the Senior Vice President of Programs at Firelight. Uh, and again, welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon or morning, depending on where you're uh, joining us from or evening, uh, whatever time zone, welcome. Uh, my name again is Loira and I'm joining from the Bronx, New York, uh, which more importantly is known as the land of the Lenape people. Uh, and during our public programs at Firelight, we like to start with the land acknowledgement uh, because I think we can all benefit from the constant reminder that we are on colonized lands. Uh, and so we welcome you to um, share where you're joining us from um, and tell us how you're doing today. Uh, I will say a quick word about Firelight Media for those that may be new to us. Um, Firelight Media was started about 20 years ago by uh, filmmaker uh, Stanley Nelson and his partner, Marsha Smith. Uh, we do a number of things. We produce uh, films about pivotal moments and movements in U.S. history, uh, as well as do uh, a number of programs to support uh, filmmakers of color uh, along different stages of their careers, whether their early career or emerging or um, sort of more mid-career filmmakers. We offer a number of different programs and artist support initiatives and we also do impact and engagement work, which is really aimed at connecting with and serving communities of color and centering communities of color as um, primary audiences for nonfiction cinema. And as I said at the top, this afternoon, this panel conversation is part of Beyond Resilience, which is a special event series that launched in, in June um, and really uh, is meant to be a space to lift up the thought leadership, the experiences, the visions, the desires uh, and ideas of Black, Indigenous, um, and POC filmmakers, programmers, curators, everyone who's part of the ecosystem that makes up nonfiction cinema in the United States. Um, and so, with that, I just want to say it's a real uh, pleasure today to be part of this collaboration with the Undocumented Film, with the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, um, to bring you this conversation that will be um, featuring the voices of uh, filmmakers, podcasters, storytellers who are creating from the perspective of um, undocumented experiences and centering the lives of undocumented communities. Um, so it's a real joy, and I want to acknowledge and thank our ASL interp interpreter, Andrea Lust, uh, who has been with us now for a few episodes. Thank you and welcome back, Andrea. And now, uh, finally, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this conversation. Um, and I am looking up her, um, her bio because I, I want to make sure that we get to hear a little bit about her and her amazing work uh, before we jump in. So Luna Moya, who is our moderator today, is a bilingual documentary editor with 10 years of experience in the film and television industry. Luna is a formerly undocumented queer and disabled filmmaker. Her debut directorial film, The Rights of Butterflies, launched with a screening tour to successfully pass the DREAM Act in Maryland. So with that, I wanna say thank you, Luna, and welcome, and I'll pass it on to you. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everybody to Undocumenting, Storytelling Through the Undocumented Less. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Um, and first, I would like to thank Firelight for having us. This is uh, our second collaboration with UFC, the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective. Um, we were together at Sundance earlier this year when some people may have already had like a pre-exposure to Rona, possibly. But uh, uh, we collaborate on the panel for Undocumented and Unerasable. 
And so for those that are not aware, UFC, the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, is a filmmakers collective that tackles the systemic inequities that undocumented immigrant people face in the filmmaking industry. Uh, and so we center the expertise of um, undocumented immigrant folks and not only through our stories, but also our expertise, our creative power, and as primary audiences. Um, and um, I will be your moderator, and um, you will see soon um, a real video to what I have, a little bit of my work. Lo tienes que exprimir porque si no, no se quita. Las pelotitas. Ah, sí. Si no las exprimes, se hace la, se hace la infección ahí. Hay que quitarlo, hay que exprimirlo para que salga toda la, la sangre y no se... And joining us for today's panelists, uh, we have some amazing undocumented um, storytellers and creatives. Uh, we have Armit Kaur, who is an undocu, which means undocumented South Asian um, storyteller, uh, who's making films on anti-Blackness and the caste system. And um, not only is she a storyteller, but she's also working in startups as she's doing um, uh, a startup for uh, creatives and offering employment uh, um, to connect them with employment services. Uh, we also have Danae Joseph, who is um, a podcast host for the Undocumented Black Girl podcast. Uh, she's a sought after commentator on issues about the undocumented immigrant experience and also the Black experience. And um, she has been featured on The Guardian, on Vogue, on Essence, and a lot more. And lastly, uh, we have Tadio Guerrero, who is an undocumented Harvard graduate and also a filmmaker. Um, he's the director of the 2019 film Rocio and also the co-director for the 2013 film uh, Dream the Ferg. And as he states in his bio, he is a bad hombre, but he's also a great son and he also boxes. So I'll let the panelists take it away with a little bit to expand on themselves and their work. My name is Amrit. Uh, I'm an undocumented South Asian queer femme uh, identifying person residing in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles. Um, I have recently just uh, started a docu-series on the anti-blackness and caste systems uh, in the South Asian community in the Western world, so the United States and Canada combined. Um, and this was kind of uh, sparked by seeing a lot of anti-blackness on social media uh, by a lot of influencers and a lot of folks that I unfortunately have known as well. Um, and then seeing that like they weren't really 
um, wanting to help black folks in their solidarity, but always wanting to take black culture and always wanting to take the language that black folks have um, used over time. So that's one of the things I'm doing. And then I'm also a co-founder of an organization called Museroom. Museroom is an employment service uh, company based in LA that helps marginalized creatives, so performing arts and visual artists, uh, find employment services in Southern California, as well as get gigs and contract work. Because as we know, marginalized folks like myself um, and my partner, Donald Albee Stewart, who is also a black musician, um, it's really hard to find work here, especially as there's so many white gatekeepers in these different positions that we really, really want. So that's kind of what I'm into right now. And yeah, thank you for joining us. As an undocumented South Asian person that grew up in a post 9-11 xenophobic world, I know how easy it is to feel unsafe and how hard it is to move forward and want to make a change. Our stories are communal stories, and these are stories that oftentimes are erased or not heard. And that is exactly why I think it is important to do such things as the census, as a South Asian person. Growing up, I walked on eggshells since my parents told my siblings and I that if we ever shared our immigration story with anyone, we'd be taken away from them. In 2016, I remember getting a call from my mom, and she was asking me if the best thing to do now for her would be to close all the blinds and lock the front door because ICE or the MAGA people would come to our door. This really, really shaped my understanding of the world, what it means to be a human being in a time when brown people were not welcomed. Now that I am a lot older and more aware, I understand that I was not alone in my experiences. The census is the first step for my family to help out in our community and to build uh, better bridges with other communities. The census doesn't ask immigration status questions and any other data that is collected through the census is protected by law. So I think that's what convinced my parents to actually fill it out this year is knowing that they will not be questioned or asked and if enumerators do come to our door, they're not allowed to ask about our status and to figure out if we have documents. What will help in lessening the chances of enumerators coming to your door is actually encouraging everyone to fill out the census beforehand, whether it's online, through the mail, or by phone. If we're not all working towards being free and helping everyone else in our community, who are we really helping? The time to act is now, so take the first step today. And now we have Danae Joseph introduce uh, herself. My name is Danae Joseph, and I'm an undocumented and Black immigrant from Belize, Central America. I immigrated here at the age of seven years old, and I'm currently working in the immigrant rights organizing space. And the reason why I founded my podcast, the Undocumented Black Girl Podcast, is because I felt as though there was an adequate representation of my undocumented and Black brothers and sisters. When we talk about immigration, there tends to be a concentration of efforts on it being a Latinx issue, and more specifically, it being a Mexican issue. And so as a result, the approximate 619,000 undocumented and Black immigrants are left to suffer in silence. And so that's why I'm honored to be a part of conversations like this one that really centers the diversity within our immigrant community. Thank you. So I'm sure you remember that. And if you would elaborate upon some of the stories that you've heard from these individuals that you've encountered, what have you heard on the ground? What are these people telling you? Danae, uh, let's let just say that I, I really haven't slept in the past mm -hmm. four years. I have gained 45 pounds um, mm -hmm. because of, of, of what we, we are dealing with in the eyes of those people you mentioned that mother who was in tapachula screaming yeah. ayudame ayudame help me help mm. me because my child my baby is in right. need we saw her tears face mm. to her nose to right 
that's how traumatic this was mm, mm, mm. to witness to see and one thing you mentioned in is the fact that the story went nowhere mm. is the fact that after a week it was forgotten then right. it takes yep. us back to 2016 when we had over 10,000 black bodies at the border Hmm. Nobody cared about that. It wasn't part of the mainstream story right. because there were black bodies. It wasn't until the second, the third wave. It wasn't hmm. until the caravan when, when, when the president tweeted, when the president started accusing migrants and 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 people that are part of the caravans as being murderers and mm -hmm. criminals that right. people started looking because black bodies do not matter mm. Mm -mm. and that is the reality it and is no people might say you know you keep on saying that so it is 2020 it's all of that we had a black president <laughs> and in Thank you so much for that audio clip of the podcast Undocumented Black Girl. So you can find that on iTunes and take a listen for more episodes. That was very powerful and very true of certain narratives that are uplifted and certain ones that are not. Um, and now we'll go into our third panelist, Darío Guerrero. Darío. Uh, my name is Darío. I am, as everyone else here, I'm undocumented now. Some were formerly undocumented. I can't say the same yet. I'm looking for a bride. I work in filmmaking. Hello from Los Angeles, California. I'm here in my backyard. Um, there's my dog. I stave off the crippling depression of being undocumented and living in this country by taking punches to the face in boxing. Um, I have a film about my mom and her battle with cancer, whose trailer we're going to watch in a little bit. Uh, currently, I am working on a film about the Central American migrant caravan, so we'll get a little more into that, but uh, that's, that's me for now. Thank you. Um, yeah, like Denise says, how is it that you have your own song? That's a Norteña, right? Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, so as you all see, we have an amazing set of talented uh, filmmakers and storytellers and creatives. And um, now we're going to go into our actual panel and ask um, a panelist, the panel, some questions. Um, so my first question to you all is, Right now, times are urgent. Um, we're going through a worldwide pandemic and um, Black Lives Matter movement is, is strong as it should be. And it's also having a rippling effect in the filmmaking industry. Although some of the things have already, were already in place before with Oscar So White um, and things like that. 
But with all of these things that are occurring right now, there seems that there's this like urgent need to document almost this in this anxiety way of like, we have to go and get this. And as undocumented filmmakers who learn resilience by documenting our own experiences, this isn't something new to us as far as having that urgency to document. Um, and so my question to y'all is, what is your takeaway from that? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Any advice or precautions as filmmakers are going out and documenting these times? Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for that question, Luna. Uh, for me, um, I think it's been great to see so many folks um, on a very large scale, you know, uh, show solidarity, show up for Black folks, um, and make space for Black folks, space that is very much needed in this time, as well as like every other time in this country um, and globally. So that's been great. For me, I've, I've been a little concerned, though, because um, as you said, there is a need right now. Like a lot of people are like, oh, what can I do? What can I do? Like, so a lot of folks are trying to like, you know, take actionable steps. But sometimes it seems as if those actionable steps may not be the best ones to take. So I myself like had to check myself because I'm like, you know, um, I want to like, you know, I want to help folks like this, but it's like, I have to, you know, defer and I have to get advice or like I have to, you know, make space for black folks to do so. And something that I've been noticing a lot recently as well is in the documentary world specifically, a lot of folks who are not black um, there'll be people of color or white folks are wanting to make these like important pieces on, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. But it's like something that we got to realize is that we've had our chances. We've had the opportunities to make our own content. And it's like, it's really concerning to know that like so many folks like still have not checked their privilege and not checked that like, it's not okay for us to be the ones you know, upholding um, the same systems that are keeping Black people oppressed, even by simply making a video, even by simply, you know, like, creating projects that are meant to, like, you know, help Black folks, but it's like, who is it really profiting? So, for me, I think um, the biggest takeaway is, like, to make sure that if we are making content, to make sure that, like, the people that are represented in that content are the ones leading it, and are the ones that, if there is any profit, making that profit, and um, having you know, opportunities for themselves because it's it's just so disheartening. Even in my own South Asian community, like the influencers I was talking about in my docu-series, they're all about posting, you know, one little black, uh, you know, screen on their Instagrams, but in their daily life, like I literally hear all of them using the N-word, you know, like wearing box braids. And it's like, where was your solidarity then? Um, so for me, it's like, it's great that people are getting connected now, but as people of color and white folks, we need to take a step back and like, really really like actually think about what impact our filmmaking our creative work is having for those specific communities that are affected absolutely i think storytelling right now is incredibly crucial especially when we can't rely upon traditional media to be our sole outlet because what we've been seeing via media outlets like telemundo and univision and i'm going to call it out is a lot of anti-blackness and that anti-blackness has showcased one narrative and one narrative alone and that is that of looters and correlating the movement for black lives to looting right so there is this purposeful refusal to talk about the entire story which is that this is about george floyd but it's about the larger movement for black lives which is that black lives are under attack not just in the united states of america but across the globe and so what we've seen storytellers do filmmakers do photographers do right because these are all mediums of storytelling we've seen them really pick up where the media has failed and that is telling stories that aren't traditionally given the space, right? Because what tends to happen is we create this notion of hierarchy pertaining to who is given that media spotlight, who is given the articles. And so as a result, many crucial voices and stories are left out because they don't have access to those spaces. And so the role of storytellers right now is to tell those stories that people are refusing to tell and to do so in a transparent manner and to do so in an inclusive manner. And so what I've seen the UFC do, the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective do, is really be mindful about 
you know, like Emirates said, going ahead and deferring when need be, because it's okay to pass along an opportunity to someone who is capable of having that cultural competency to tell the story and to do the work and allow them to get the credit and to get the resources from telling their stories. And so that's what I've witnessed. People really filling in the gaps of what traditional media might you know, have a lapse in considering and really being multifaceted and multidimensional about the way that they do that. And that's been really powerful to witness. And I think also the role of filmmakers and storytellers right now is to do so with a level of anonymity. Because we've seen time and time again in which People like ICE, you know, police departments have been able to track back the folks featured in documentaries and featured or tagged on Instagram or Twitter and use that as a tracking point to get these folks and to hold them captive, right, and to incarcerate them. And so the role of story play, uh, storytellers right now is not just storytelling. It's about maintaining the anonymity of those who they're filming, right, and making sure that their safety is considered first and foremost most and the story while important be secondary to their own safety and freedom moving forward yeah um building off of what Danae and Amrit said uh I remember in college one of the schools of thought behind documentary filmmaking is what's it called cinema verite or fly on the wall filmmaking where you just you know stand back try to watch things happen but you know, never hint that the camera is there or don't let people look at the camera. Just try not to influence the situation at all. And that's just not possible. Um, I took a brief pause to Google what it's called right now. But there's this thing called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, which basically states that simply by observing something, you influence its behavior. Mm -hmm. So every story we tell is gonna have an effect both on the subjects, on ourselves, and on the world in which we release it. So the one thing that I'm grappling with right now is that I, I don't just wanna make a film about something happening and stand back. In the process of making it, you know, something good is gonna to have to happen for, for the people I'm working with um, and just for the world in general. Like, shout out to Bam Pamela Yattis, who's in the, in the chat right now. She has a film about um, revolution in Central America that actually led to bringing down a dictator. And uh, Seth Hernandez, also of the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, worked on a film about uh, a trans woman being murdered in the Philippines by an American serviceman. And the film itself became a, a vehicle for change and for people to mobilize and demand accountability. So I think that's you know, especially now in this time where these massive uh, movements are happening, we can't just hope to, to, to sit back and, and, and capture them unfolding, but our involvement needs to have a positive effect. And I guess that's the problem, figuring out how to, how to manage that, but I think that should be more of the mindset we enter this. Thank you all for answering. And yeah, that's, that's really true. With uh, documentary filmmaking, there is such a, desire to be that fly in the wall. Um, and there's such a, a thirst <laughs> to, to be objective, but we're not objective. We're, everything is subjective. You know, like the name of this panel, Lens, like all of us have our own lens and our own perspective. And as times are unfolding, like take a, take a beat to, to check what, how it is that you're coming with that lens to film. Um, in particular with undocumented issues, uh, like Danae states and mentions, it's not just the filmmaking part, it's not just the storytelling part, but it's also the anonymity or the legal counsel that should also be taken into consideration. Uh, my next question um, is with, let's see, so one of the first actions that the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective has had was an open letter to producers of Living Undocumented um, as they had unjust staffing practices. So in a documentary series for Netflix about undocumented issues, nobody that was directing or operating the lens was undocumented or had undocumented experience. 
And, you know, they made the letter not just for that series, but beyond because it's not the first time that this happens. And it's even now as like filmmakers are going out and documenting things, you know, it's occurring right now too. Um, and uh, with that in mind, I kind of like to coin and say the phrase of making sure to hire folks for their, for creative positions of power and not just social clout consulting. And so the consulting part is necessary, but from my personal experience, um, you know, even from like major undocumented films that you all have seen, the filmmakers kind of like approach me, but more of in a sense of my connection, to, more of my connection to the social capital, to the activists that I knew, and you know that was really frustrating because on one hand it was like okay like i believe in you i see you we're both brown we you know something something is still good but on the other hand it didn't feel like a true investment and so um I, as there is a conversation for making sure that black poc brown and documented people are hired um I want you to, to be considered as well, to not only have us in positions of social consulting, although that is very important and like do hire folks for that, but we're also talented creatives. So creative positions of power in editing, in DP, in cinematography, in directing, in writing, all of those are just as crucial and important to make sure that we have that um, stance. And to the panel, I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on that, any stories, personal stories that you feel comfortable with sharing. Um, and uh, Danae, I know that you also are a racial justice consultant, so anybody looking to hire, uh, hit her up. Um, and yeah. I absolutely want to touch on that point, Luna, to the documentary that was being shopped around before it was eventually put out. I want folks to be clear that this was something that was shopped around for a long time. An organization after organization said no to this project, right? And the reason why folks said no is because of Luna's main point, which is how do you expect our participation but refuse to allow any of our creatives to take ownership over this work? And the organization that I worked with last, they had approached us um, about doing this work. And it was this idea that we're telling you no, we're telling you what our concerns were, we're providing you sufficient opportunity to fix these things, right? To make it right before it's out to the public. And they simply didn't care. They had a vision in mind. And this isn't to call anyone out, it's just to really call a spade a spade. They had an idea in mind and they just ran with the idea. And so there's often this notion, right, that as undocumented people, as marginalized people of color, right, as people at the intersections of not one, but two or many identities, there's this assumption by those who are creating that we are just the subjects, that's it, right? That we just need to be on the other side telling our stories, but not capturing these stories. And the reason why that is, is because there's so many stereotypical notions about who immigrants are and what we are and what we do. And so because of those stereotypical notions, there isn't an allowance of the traditional film and storytelling industry to allow us a seat at the table. And that's extremely detrimental and toxic because there are so many talented filmmakers and storytellers who are doing this work, like some of the folks who are accompanying me on this panel, and have the vision and have the expertise like that of Luna, who has more than a decade of work, right? And so we really need to start unlearning these notions of who can do and who can't and provide opportunity to those who are marginalized to also be in positions of power to do the storytelling. So I think that's important. And I think we also need to look into, for those of you who are listening and potentially looking at opportunities to tell stories, is to compensate those who you're telling their story compensate folks for their time. If me as an undocumented woman, when I ask 
people to do any project for me. I try to provide any compensation possible. So if I can do that as an undocumented woman, I think with those who have fellowships and grants and resources at their disposal, there's really no excuse not to pay people for their expertise. It's not just their narrative. Those years of living through the experiences that we've lived through is expertise, right? We don't necessarily need a degree to be able to validate that our life has been, right, a research project in everything that people are getting degrees of, right? Those immigrant rights, you know, um, theorists and all of these things, we are that. We have lived this. Pay folks to do this work, center, you know, marginalized people, people of color, indigenous folks, provide the opportunities to the underrepresented and to look beyond the main framework of what we consider to be immigrant rights and immigration and allow folks who are API and black, and there's white immigrants too, white undocumented immigrants too. It's just that we've assigned them the terminology of expats and some way somehow we as brown and black people are given the terminology of quote illegal right so just try to unlearn what you know about this movement of this work and provide opportunities to undocumented storytellers wow okay Janae you are my queen the whole time you were talking I was like yes um, Oh, you just went off and I love it. Everything you said, I just want to reiterate with everyone. Um, and then just, um, just with that, like, I think everything you just said is literally the reason why so many of us, like in the undocumented community with so many different complex intersectional identities, end up having this thing called imposter syndrome when we do try to document our own stories. And so like for me, I've in the last like, few years I've had the opportunity and like you know the benefit of you know being part of a few fellowships um and I just actually recently left one in May um it would it was called Outfest's Outset Filmmaking Program and the reason I left it is because of the same exact thing where they had this diversity quota that they wanted so they wanted me because I'm an undocumented queer South Asian filmmaker in Los Angeles but they didn't have the resources or the knowledge or the education to support someone like me in my position um, even though they're housed in the LA LGBT center so it just goes mm -hmm. to show you that no matter how big a film festival is no matter how big a program is um, if it is run by white people it will always have holes in it if their executive team if their board does not have people of color in charge for a program that is meant for people of color um, or marginalized queer folks or undocumented folks whatever it is then that program will never ever actually authentically help those people that it's meant to help. So for me, that's one thing that I think um, is like really big and that I'm super passionate about is definitely calling out these programs that are always trying to use us, you know, and utilize our stories, utilize our different experiences to continuously like, you know, gain grants, you know, get um, extra benefits and like, you know, get all these donors and sponsors like, oh, look, these are our poster children that we're helping. It's like, that's not going to work anymore. It's 2020. And now we need to actually put, be putting folks like ourselves in the forefront of these movements. Like, and some of these folks that are executives need to be stepping back. So, yeah. yeah. I do want to take a second to also um, thank the attendees for watching and um, to remind you that we have a Q&A. It's at the bottom of the screen. So you, if you all have any questions that uh, you would like to ask, we're going to have a Q&A uh, in a few minutes and we'll, we'll I'll be glad to answer them. Anonymous attendee. Hey, what sort of stories are important to you as filmmakers? Or was that a... That was a test question. <laughs> but we can also ask, like, answer it if, <laughs> like, once we get to the Q&A, if you like, later. Um, uh, yeah, and, you know, to all of this, it's not just uh, creative positions of, within the film, of having the role of the director or the editor or the cinematographer, but, um, like the panelists are saying, Armour and Benet, um, who's in your board? Who is making these executive decisions? And I have seen even like this, like change is, is coming about just very slowly and it's uh, a bit frustrating that it took an eruption to almost happen. Like I think the Kashmir Fellowship sent out an email this morning that they're going to adjust um, folks on their board um, and that they, 
took notice that for their uh, emerging editor fellow, that it's always been white. And I'm just like, I told you all that in my application for the diversity edit like program, but it's happening. So that's good. It's just, it's just very uh, slow and it's frustrating. But um, for here's some more push to have more undocumented storytellers um, behind and in front of the lens. And um, getting into the topic of narratives, um, even within us um, undocumented, documented or formerly undocumented storytellers, uh, like the name was mentioning earlier, the news can sort of um, kind of like dictate a narrative that we follow or that we like push back against. And I would like, I would like to add on to that, that sometimes we tend to follow that. And one of that being this like good or bad immigrant narrative in terms of, um, you know, if you are going to school, you know, if you were brought here without your own choice and it was your parents that brought you, you know, like just, there can be all these narratives that are meant to sort of protect the undocumented immigrant, but it does so um, by using um, systemic oppression in terms of like class or, or color, um, because it's excluding folks who don't, aren't going through the educational route, which is like a lot, and a lot of us would. Um, white supremacy exists in institutions very strong, um, and we have been taught things in like one linear way that um, as storytellers with visuals, we may have different ways of learning. And so with all these different narratives in, in mind that can be toxic within our storytelling. And um, like Dana was mentioning earlier as well, uh, it's mostly known that it's like a brown issue when it comes to undocumented immigration, but that really erases uh, the black undocumented experience. And so I'd like to ask you all, what are some other narratives that you all see unfold in filmmaking? Uh, precautions, any further thoughts that you have? Um, some like uh, maybe narrative trends that we see unfolding. Uh, I guess, okay. Um, so back in college there, I was very lucky because some of the professors there had made careers out of the genre of personal documentary. Uh, back in the day, they would like have their Bolex film cameras up on their shoulders and just be like filming family life. And then later on, um, you know, of course they're old white men. Later on, they go edit this release it into the world and like receive universal acclaim. And so we took these classes and I'm like, I, I love and respect them. Uh, I studied that and I said, okay, you know, when my mom got sick, I turned the camera on our family. And uh, I thought, okay, well, you know, this is a story worth telling as much as any other. And now with, you know, the advent of cell phones and TikTok, Instagram, people document their, their lives every day. Um, I think that is a sign of hope because now we have access to the technology with which to capture and tell our stories. You know, a lot of the times we, we spend that technology and energy on making GIFs or looking at memes, but we have the capabilities to really reach a lot of people and show them something very personal. And I think that, that part of the, the being personal is something that I really struggled with in making the film about my mom. Because as you saw in the trailer, you know, she got sick with cancer and uh, we just started filming how our family would react to this diagnosis. And, you know, of course, mistakes are gonna be made, unflattering things are gonna be captured in the film and eventually released once, once I edited the film, in the process of making and showing cuts to people, like one of the big things that I struggled with was, oh man, I'm showing them my life, my family, me. Like, if they don't like it, it's reflections on me. And, you know, that would hurt. But one thing that took me a long time to understand was really important is that it's not about me. 
this whatever I capture and whatever I start showing and telling to people, you know, they're taking it for what it is now. And it should just be a reflection on my work, not on my character or my mom's. Um, as undocumented filmmakers, where we're not accustomed to, well, no one's accustomed to us. And now we're telling our stories. We're not accustomed to getting the feedback on that. Uh, you know, some things are going to be, are, are going to hurt, but they're probably, hopefully they come from a place of constructive, constructive, constructive criticism. Otherwise, there will be people who are going to come at us from places of a not so much construction. And we're going to have to be prepared for that. And I think, yeah, we've, we see, we see, we see how trends are happening in this country, but what I would like to say is just, uh, we all have a cell phone. We all have our stories and, you know, it takes a little bit of bravery because it's, it's not all peaches and cream out there and the world sometimes can get very ugly, but it's by lifting our voices in unity that we can be heard. Thank you. Um, we should go into Q and A soon. Um, so I don't want to cut off the Nayar Amrit. We had um, a response to that, but if we could make it a little bit short. Or if um, you would like me to go into Q and A, I can do that as well. Yeah, we could go into Q and A, no worries. All right, sounds good. So for our first question, let me answer live. Okay. How do we hire, pay an undocumented filmmaker? Um, so as we are, uh, well, first I'd like to say that that's possible. Um, as we are a filmmaker collective and not uh, legal experts, uh, we're going to, I'm going to paste this in the chat for everybody. All panelists, attendees. Um, I'm going to ref direct to some resources. Um, Documentary Producers Alliance had um, a list of uh, resources of immigrants rising um, and our own link tree for Documentary Filmmakers Collective, it's also there. Um, but they have different information as far as how to go about that. And of course, with people who are, are documented, they can be hired. That's what DACA um, like is for. Um, but as far as like more further legal counsel, I would say go to those experts. And then also if you are using those resources, I would encourage you to find a way to donate money to those organizations. Um, and and um, yeah, uh, to pay for their intellectual labor. Okay, the second question is, appreciate the thoughts, but we know this stuff. How do we get out of this echo chamber and bring those white, gatekeeper, white gatekeepers into this conversation and ask for actual change? Um, so a lot of us don't know this stuff. Um, you know, it's great that you do know this information. Um, as far as getting white gatekeepers into this conversation, um, like, there, like there have been institutions that are making change. Like I mentioned, um, the Karen Schmier uh, Editing Fellowship. But the point more is, um, as our panelists have also mentioned, is to pass that power. So if for white gatekeepers, if they do have that power and you are a board member for some diversity workshop or some other um, filmmaking entity, pass that power. Um, um, and it's, I would also say too that I'm not depending also a whole bunch on uh, white gatekeepers to make change for myself. We've all done that for ourselves. Each one of our panelists has made some sort of work to make change uh, directly within their community or beyond. Um, and so don't feel too much like you're relying on a white person to like save us. Um, Okay, okay. How are you all feeling about the mainstream narratives about essential workers in this moment? What is missing from the current conversation? Hmm. I will let you all answer this. 
for me, what I'm feeling about the mainstream immigrant narrative is that it completely erases that of the people that this country is trying to push out, right? Time and time again, we've seen this administration prove that it doesn't value immigrant lives. And that is by him refusing to give mixed status family any money from the CARES Act, right? Um, that's by him refusing to give any undocumented students access to funding from the CARES Act, right? Whereas as we see that our undocumented brothers and sisters are essential workers, whether that be from the farm workers to the people who are working in the grocery stores, all the way to the folks who are literally serving as um, healthcare professionals during COVID-19 pandemic. And we've seen no attention being given to that or little attention being given to that. And it's interesting when we look at the prioritization of kicking us out, where in this moment, the country would not have been able to stay afloat without immigrant contributions. So I, I definitely think that's an important narrative that we need to uplift. Thank you, Danae. Um, and we'll go into our last question as we start to wrap up. And uh, if there's also any final thoughts um, that people would like to say, let's see. Um, let me read this first so I, I can uh, try to combine it maybe. That's fine. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to combine these two questions. Um, so one is thanks uh, to Firelight and all the panelists. What do you all see as the intersection between immigrant rights movement and Black Lives Matter? And the second question is, uh, do you feel like predominantly white institutions can ever make a meaningful change uh, in the work that they do even if they hire uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color to leadership positions? Or do you think that we should build our organization from scratch? Hmm. Sorry. You can answer one of them if you like. It's a bit loaded <laughs> to say both. So um, I'll go ahead and start. I um, um, I'll say, oh, go uh, ahead. Go ahead, Emery. Okay, so I'll answer really briefly because I know we're rushing um, to try to wrap it up. Um, but to this question, to the last question about the correlation between the immigrant rights movement and that for the movement of Black Lives, I would say that they're not mutually exclusive at all. The movement for Black Lives is currently asking that this nation defunds the police. And defunding the police, we can't talk about defunding the police without abolishing ICE. Immigrant rights has been asking to abolish ICE since its formulation. So when we talk about those two systems, we need to recognize that they go hand in hand, right? Because ICE hasn't always existed. Police has always existed. And its original form was meant to capture enslaved people, right? That, that's where police comes from. And so when we look at this work and this idea that those two things are completely separate, we need to realize that immigration would not have been possible if not for the civil rights movement and the work of Dr. Martha Luther King and people like John Lewis, who literally paved the way for us to be where we are today. It's through the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act of 1965 that we were able to get the Immigration and Naturalization Act. As a result of that effort, that took away um, the limitations for who can come from which countries. So that history has been erased. People don't often talk about the correlation to the civil rights movement. And so for that reason, that's why we've often seen gaps in our movement organizing. But I think this time has allowed us to be able to continue to see those intersections and mobilize together. Because we can't talk about family separation without talking about the origins of family separation, which were the auction block. We can't talk about defunding the police without talking about the way that our, our immigrants are immigrant bodies are hunted by ICE, right? We can't talk about what's going on in detention centers without talking about what's going on with mass incarceration and private prisons. So all of these things are correlated. The only problem is we've been taught to believe that one another is the problem versus the system that continually disenfranchises all of us. So that's the root cause. I know we have to wrap it up. So go ahead. Um, if you want to go ahead, Emirates. Uh, just my really last quick point. Thank you for sharing that, Danae. Um, 
So uh, to someone uh, who asked the question of like, or do you think that we should build our own organizations from scratch? Well, guess what? We did. We built the Ndaki, uh, Ndaki Filmmakers Collective because we didn't see ourselves represented and we didn't see spaces for ourselves as undocumented folks with so many complex identities and intersectional uh, identities as well. So it it's just like, yeah, we do have to create our communities and organizations and, uh, you know, nonprofits, whatever, like from scratch, because as we're seeing, even the ones, even the white organizations that are, you know, having hired like black folks and, you know, indigenous folks and people of color, they're clearly still not working. We are still getting people coming out of these organizations, like black folks coming out, writing op-eds on how they're, you know, burnt out, how they were thrown out and how they were pushed out of these organizations. So clearly there is something wrong, even with organizations that are led by white folks. So yeah, we're creating our own and that's literally why we're all here today to show you all that like, we can literally do just as good, if not better, um, at telling our own stories and helping our own folks and standing up you know, to all these different systems at play. Okay, so that's all the time that we have. Um, and this is recorded um, and I want to thank all of the panelists. Um, it's so awesome to share space with you all. You're so amazing and to be able to uh, research more into your work and get to know you all more, uh, even like further out of your filmmaking expertise, but as like startup people, as podcasters and boxers too. Um, so very awesome getting to know you all. Thank you everybody for watching um, and I will hand this off to Firelight. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Beyond Resilience. Thank you to Luna, our moderator, and our panelists, Amrit, Danae, and Dario, as well as our ASL interpreter, Andrea. Please go to firelightmedia.tv for more information on upcoming episodes.